Welcome to everyone online. Just a reminder at the outset that this Zoom meeting is being recorded. And so thank you for joining us for this Justice Week event. We have 200 or, or so attendees registered. So thank you very much for supporting the event. We're delighted to have three members of the Inside Justice team with us this evening. So let me start with some short introductions in the order in which you are going to hear from them. Firstly, Louise Shorter. Louise is the founder of Inside Justice, and many of you will know her as the producer of the BBC's long-running investigative TV series, Rough Justice. She's also an associate tutor at the School of Law, University of East Anglia, and she most recently took on a role as a member of the Ministry of Justice's Youth Justice Board. Uh, and then next, Tracy Alexander, Tracy has worked in forensic science since 1992, originally with the Metropolitan Police Service Directorate of Forensic Sciences, then as head of the Forensic Intelligence Bureau uh, to her current post as Director of Forensic Services at the City of London Police. Tracy is a fellow of King's College London, the president of the British Academy of Forensic Scientists, a trustee and advisory panel member of Inside Justice, and a member of the Chartered Society of Forensic Scientists. Her current focus, you'll be interested to hear, is the provision of forensic intervention to tackle wildlife crime, with particular emphasis on rhino horn, ivory, and pangolin scales. And then finally, Damien Elaine. Damien is a former New Scotland Yard senior detective who specialised in homicide investigations and serious and organised crime. He is an associate assessor with the College of Policing, and he's taught and lectured in policing law and criminology in the UK and abroad. He has a master's degree in policing and criminal justice. He's a fellow of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust and a fellow of the RSA and a visiting lecturer at Canterbury, Christchurch, Portsmouth and Kingston Universities. So we have a stellar cast list this evening and a treat in store. I'm not going to tell you anything about Inside Justice by way of introduction because that will be the purpose of the first part of our evening. If you have questions, and I'm sure you will, please post them in the Q&A as opposed to the chat function. For those of you who aren't familiar with Zoom, I can't believe many of you aren't, there is both a chat and a Q&A function. So we'll be using the Q&A function for questions this evening. And you can post those questions either with your name or anonymously. And if you think of a question, post it as we go along before you forget about it. Uh, do it at any point, and I'll try to make sure that we get to the questions in the second part of our event, when we'll hear some answers to those questions from our speakers. Now, for some crime writers, the perfect crime is one for which someone else has been prosecuted and convicted. Of course, in the real world, as lawyers, we know that simply as a miscarriage of justice. So I'm going to hand over to Louise to tell you about the work of Inside Justice. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Thank you. And thank you all very much for being here this evening and to the Bar Council, of course, for hosting us. We're very pleased to be here. And my first Chris Whitty moment, if I could have my next slide, please. And the next one. Thank you so much. So I'm going to just start off telling you really very briefly about the sort of setup of, of Inside Justice so that you understand how the organization works. Damien will tell you much more at the end about the intricacies of our work and how we go about casework. But what I really want to say to begin with is that we are a registered charity, which means that we rely heavily on what we write, rely totally on donations, primarily from trusts and foundations, and also donations of time. Um, the reason, the main motivation for wanting to come and, and uh, spend the evening with you tonight was really to try and reach out to legal professionals to say, if there are really troubling cases that you are aware of, uh, whether you want to carry on working on them or not, those cases will always um, carry much more weight for us if they come from legal professionals such as yours. So, so um, these, are the, these are the areas in which you may be able to help or get involved with our work. And I'd really like it if you could just keep these in mind, please, as we go through the next hour or so. So I'm going to start off by telling you a little, a little bit of my background. 
Um, and that was is one of journalism, as Derek's already said. I worked at the BBC for 16 years, uh, first of all in Radio, uh, Radio 4 and Radio 5 Live and also um, on, on various uh, uh, legal programmes there. So that was predominantly uh, law in action at Radio 4. And then I moved over to television um, onto the BBC's Rough Justice programme, which those of you who are old enough will remember was the very long running investigative strand that, um, that, that looked into claims of innocence by serving pr prisoners. Um, that, that strand ran for 27 years, was responsible in total for 18 murder convictions being quashed. Um, and that came for me, I was working on those programmes and, and even in my teenage years before that, uh, that came at a time when there were the really big infamous cases, the Guildford Four and Birmingham Six and Stephen Kisco and the like, but also I think the fact that Rough Justice were putting out programmes that were about ordinary everyday people that brought the criminal justice system um, into question had a profound effect on me and, and is the reason that I carry on working on those cases today. So I, my, my job tonight is going to be to talk, talk you through a case that I worked on when I, when I was first at Rough Justice. Um, it was really the case that led to the charity Inside Justice being set up. Um, it was one that where the work continued on this case after the, the charity had been established. And that was through the work of Tracy Alexander, who's going to tell you about the post-conviction work. So, so the work I'm going to talk to you about is everything leading up to the, the Court of Appeal. Tracy will then talk to you about the scientific investigation that took place post-conviction that led, uh, spoiler alert, to the real, real killer being identified. And then Damien is going to come in at the end to really give you much more detail on, on how we do things at Inside Justice. So uh, Barry White uh, was convicted of the murder of his girlfriend, Rachel Manning. We're going back to December 2000. Uh, Barry's, I'm so sorry, I've completely forgotten to say a new slide every time. I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm not used to saying a new slide. If you could go on, please, to pass that one on to the next one. So that's super, and I won't forget from now. I'm so sorry. So we're going back to December 2000. Um, Barry was convicted of the murder of his girlfriend, Rachel Manning. Uh, they'd been at a, a fancy dress party together. Um, and they'd gone on to a nightclub um, that evening after the village, the, the family party in the village hall ended. And th this is CCTV footage grab that we've got from, from, the, the, from when they went into the nightclub. So you can see Barry on the left and, and Rachel with the, with the blue wig on. Um, and this is, as I say, going, for them going into the nightclub. When they came out of the club, uh, there was a sort of a scuffle. There was a, um, an, an altercation between Barry and another guy who was outside the nightclub. So you can see now that, that Barry is, face, is facing us with his arms outstretched. Um, Rachel is standing there with the white shirt and black skirt on. I, I'm sorry, I haven't said it again. I'm so sorry. I need to keep looking at the, the top one. I'm sorry. Um, forgive me. So as, you, as they came out of the nightclub, you can see that, that Barry and Rachel are standing there and there's an altercation uh, um, outside of the club. Um, which, which really led to the events unfolding as they did that night. Um, Barry, and, um, Barry was going to wait at the club, he got a kebab, he wasn't going to go home with Rachel, they, they'd never intended to go home together, um, but they were going to spend, spend a bit more uh, time outside the club. And, and this altercation was, the, was the, the impetus for Barry deciding that actually he was going to leave the club, he was, wouldn't wait outside for a taxi, and he would wait, uh, or walk around to his friend, friend Keith's house instead. If we could have the next slide, please, <laughs> finally. Um, so Barry got round to his friend Keith's house. We've got Barry on the left here and, and Keith on the right-hand side. Um, he'd been there for five or 10 minutes. It was only about a 15 minute walk from the, from the nightclub, not too far. Um, he'd been there for about, about five or 10 minutes when the phone rang. And the phone records obviously evidence the, the, the phone calls coming in. And Barry said that it was Rachel on the phone she said that she'd attempted to um, also walk around to Keith's house. She'd gone back to the club. She was intending to get a taxi, but the taxi uh, queue was too long. She thought she'd give up on that. And so according to Barry, his version was that he, he um, that she phoned when he was around at Keith's house and, and said that, he, uh, um, that she wanted to meet up with him. She tried to find Keith's house, but Milton Keynes really is one of these sort of myriads of, of, um, of housing estates. And so she hadn't managed to find the house and she asked if they would meet her somewhere. There was a blockbuster video store that wasn't too far away. They both knew it and so they agreed that they would meet there. And sure enough, CCTV footage that the police later found 
showed Barry and, um, a, a arriving in Keith's van, the two of them in Keith's van, attempting to meet up with, with Rachel. Certainly the van arrived there. Uh, next slide, please. Three days later, however, Rachel Manning's body was found in Woodland just outside of Milton Keynes. It was about eight miles from the, the centre of Milton Keynes, and obviously at that stage, a, a murder investigation was launched. Um, unfortunately for Keith, he was a, um, an Amtrak delivery driver this friend, friend of ours who, who really just sort of, through no fault of his own, got caught up in all of this. He was driving um, past the end of the road. His Amtrak delivery journey took him past this lane where the, where the police activity was obvious. Um, and so he stopped and he spoke to police officers there and told them that his friend's girlfriend had gone missing three days before um, and asked what was going on. Um, and that, that interaction with the police um, put Keith on, on their radar, understandably. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, the difficulty was that there was a local newspaper reporter, and the local newspaper reporter um, took a, a photograph of Keith's van, which you can see here, being put onto the police low loader um, and carted away. And that was front page news right at the very start of the police investigation, which, which didn't help the investigation at all. Um, and so that, that so we uh, so we now have the the, the police have um, sort of very soon after identify Rachel Manning. They they know that she'd gone missing three days before. They know that the last person known to have been with Rachel was the the boyfriend Barry, and they know that Barry's friend, who Barry coincidentally with, had spent the latter part of that night, has just turned up at the deposition site. Next slide, please. During the course of the uh, police search, they found a crook lock that you can see here. Um, so it's one of those steering wheel locks that, that uh, locks onto the, onto the steering wheel to stop it being moved, stop it being, being stolen. Um, now, that crook lock had been used posthumously to, to bludgeon the victim. Forensic tests were done. I'm not going to sort of take a huge amount of time going through the detail of these at this stage, but forensic tests were done at that time to establish, to see whether or not they could, a link could be established between Barry White and Keith Hyatt and that crook lock, and they, they couldn't. Um, but what the police did find was a, um, a friend of Keith's who told the police that he had seen a crook lock, which he said was the same type as this one, in Keith's van when Keith used to give him, give him a lift. So there was no forensic link, but there was a witness saying that there was somebody who thought that Keith had one in his van. Next slide, please. So the police obviously also spent a fair bit of time with, with scientists looking to see whether or not a, um, a link, a forensic link, could be found between uh, the van and the deposition site. Um, and, and they did a, a, quite a bit of work on that, and that came to nothing. They couldn't find any, any link between mud samples that were in the front of the van, um, any samples that were in the back of the van, anything at all that could link it to the deposition site itself. So that, that drew a blank. Next slide, please. I'm in the swing with my next slides now. Um, but this man, Professor Kenneth Pye, was the, was the man that really changed the face of this investigation for the, for the police. He was instructed by the police. Initially, he was looking for that link between the deposition site and the van, and, and he couldn't find one, as I've just said. But he also then went on to take tapings from the van seat um, and also from the victim's clothing. So he was looking, he's a geologist, this, this particular expert, uh, but he was looking to see, okay, there was no, no link between the deposition site and the van, but could there be, well, could there be a link between the, the victim um, and the van itself? And so he basically would put down sort of, you know, I'm sure Chasey will say there's a scientific term for this that, that's alluded to me, but he basically put down sticky tape onto the van seat, picked up material from that, and was looking for a link. And he, he found um, rare particle types, rare, you have to use the word very carefully, but rare as in we don't see them in, 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 in all stuff that's around us all of the time. The, these were things like zirconium and zinc and iron, um, materials that would be used in the manufacture of certain products. Um, he found seven different particle types. So I've just given you three of those, there were another four. And he said he found those particle types on the van seat. He also found them on the tapings from the victim's skirt. And he said finding them in those two different locations meant that there was this scientific link between them. And he also went further than just saying, I can put her in the van. He also said, I can put her in the van 
in the hours after she disappeared. So he, that, that timing of it was also really, really important. And that was the evidence from Professor Pye that got this case back to the court of, uh, sorry, that got this case into, into, into court in the first place. Next slide, please. So it went to trial on the 5th of April, 2002. Barry on the left, Keith on the right. Um, Barry was convicted of murder. Keith has always said um, that he was offered a deal by the police. He's always said that he was told that if he gave evidence against Barry, um, then he wouldn't be charged or he would be charged with something less. Um, he always refused to do that, he said, because he knew that he had spent the evening with Barry. Um, from when Barry left the club, he arrived at his house. He was confident he was there. They were together until he went home at nearly five in the morning. Um, and so he always said, I'm not doing that because I know that Barry can't have been murdering her if you're talking about it being within that time frame. So Keith was charged with murder also, but he was acquitted of murder, um, but he was convicted of, of uh, perversion in the course of justice. So essentially the jury believed that Barry had come across Rachel at the phone box where those phone calls definitely took place, um, that he had murdered uh, Rachel in a fit of anger, continuing from the the altercation that happened outside the nightclub with the other guys earlier on, um, and that he had persuaded Keith to come and to help him come along to take the body to the deposition site. Next slide, please. So um, very soon after the murder conviction came in, we were contacted at Rough Justice. And I remember the letter appearing on my desk when, when I was there that day, um, and I was dispatched to go and talk to the, the family members. It, it seems like a real luxury now looking back on it, um, the two of us were given, we had just something like about two, two and a half years, it was nearly three years, but I took a, a block of maternity leave in the middle of that, um, to work solely on this case, which does seem like a huge luxury. I mean, the, the other thing I suppose to say is that you always have this sort of impression that something like Rough Justice has a massive team of people, and mostly it doesn't, mostly it's an individual producer, possibly with a reporter as well, so it's fairly small but we certainly had the luxury of time to be able to pursue things. Next slide, please. And, and we went right back to scratch. So we started investigating the case as if it was an objective cold case review. We're not campaigning on anybody's side. We are just really trying to, trying to find evidence to see whether or not these convictions are safe. And so we found this is a, um, another bit of CCTV footage um, that showed Barry as he was out searching for Rachel on foot. So, his account to the police was that he had um, he had he he'd gone out with Keith in the van to try and find Rachel. She hadn't turned back. He'd later gone out on his own, walking around the streets of Milton Keynes trying to find her. And we managed to find CCTV that sort of that, that supported that, which was helpful for that. Not enough for an appeal, but it you know put us in the right direction. And it also meant that the wind of opportunity that he had to get to actually commit the murder was 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 reduced with all, all of those steps that we could take. Next slide, please. We also found the owner of the Amtrak delivery driver, and he he had the receipts from from his his uh, from the van, and he was the person who bought the the crook clock that had been in Keith's van, and that showed that the the type of crook clock that Keith had in the van was the one that he still had in the van. Um, it didn't mean Keith couldn't have got another crook lock, but it was all again just sort of going in the right direction. Next slide, please. We were uh, we negotiated with the Ministry of Justice to go into the prison. Um, and to get DNA samples, this is Barry when he's down at HMP Swale side, um, and, and that was important because there'd been a hair found on the crook lock, which according to Barry and Keith's story, they'd had absolutely no connection to whatsoever. Um, DNA tests had been done pre-trial, they hadn't got a DNA profile, and so we commissioned more work. Um, we would struggle to do that at all today. I think COVID is obviously you know, a huge issue, but even without that, I think we would struggle to get access to, to go and be able to commission that those new tests if we wanted to today. And, and we did that work and it, and it wasn't Barry or Keith's DNA profile. But our real, next slide please. Our real turning point though, was when we met these two, two fine fellows, uh, scientists called Peter Ball and Andrew Moncrief. And they really went right back to scratch looking at the scientific work that had got that case into the Court of Appeal. Um, and they, they really wanted to um, test the basis for the claims that were made. They looked at the, at the evidence given in court. They sort of took a view that they, were, they wouldn't have gone that far. They wouldn't have taken that view. I think that's a, a, a reasonable way to put it. And so they went back to scratch, really going right back to basics to understand the scientific basis for those claims. Next slide, please. 
Um, and they also approached it, certainly Peter Ball did, in the way that we did at Rough Justice, which was, well, let's just look at the evidence and see where it takes us. So Peter Ball did a lot more work to establish whether the deposition site, which you can see here, uh, whether there are any samples from that deposition site, which could be, which could actually be scientifically linked to, to Barry or Keith, their footwear, all the samples that have been taken from those, or the van samples that were taken from the time of the murder. Um, because again, if we could find evidence, if they could find evidence that, that they actually were at that scene, they didn't want to spend the, a lot of their time doing pro bono work on other avenues. Next slide, please. We also, this is the beauty of having television, I think, involved in stuff like this, is that, um, you know, because it wants pictures and it wants activity. And so we uh, sourced van seats that were exactly the same make and model as the one that had been in Keith's van. And we got those, shipped those down to Peter Ball's laboratory at Oxford University. And he um, did, a, did that work, which, as I said before, was testing those, those sort of key, those key claims at the time of the trial. And the key claims that were the basis of Professor, Ball, uh, Professor Pye's, the trial experts, um, evidence was that not many particles would be produced. Um, some of the particles had come off of things like a cigarette lighter. Every time you, you, you struck a cigarette lighter, some particles would come off. And so he wanted to see, well, how many do you get, get come off? Because he, there was no scientific work about that. And also how, off, how quickly would they fall off of a piece of material? Next slide, please. And so we also managed to get back into the Forensic Science Service, which have beautifully kept all of the exhibits, uh, um, another subject that's close to our heart at uh, Inside Justice about the retention of material post-conviction. Um, and we were allowed to take a piece of the victim's skirt so that new scientific work could be done on exactly the same sort of fabric so that it, it, we knew it was really, really rigorous and, and robust in terms of whether there any new scientific findings could be attributed to the specific details of this case. Next slide, please. Our program went out in 2005, and that was essentially saying that um, that the the prosecution basis for the on that that scientific evidence was not just without foundation, but it not just untested, but it was completely wrong. Next slide, please. And so the case went to the Court of Appeal in 2007. Uh, the Court of Appeal had by that stage reports from I think there were three or possibly four experts who had all come together um feeding more into the defense it was a really great you know great display of scientific endeavor um, the, the court of appeal marshaled that evidence in terms of looking at how unusual that seven particle types was um, the seven particle types found in those two locations how many of those particle types could be produced in the one way that we knew they could be produced which was flicking of a lighter how long they would remain on fabric and also whether there was anything else, any other evidence, circumstantial evidence that could point a way to Keith Hyatt's van being used. Next slide, please. Um, and that scientific work, it's complex and I'm not doing it justice and I'm, forgive me all the scientists out there um, that, that, <laughs> will, that will realize, but, but essentially what that showed was there was a great body of work done by Andrew Moncrief in particular. And he had found that same assemblage of seven particle types in various other vehicles that were completely unrelated to this case. And so the simple claim that to find them on, in the van meant it must be Keith's van was just laid bare. It was nonsense. And, and Andrew Moncrief's work really showed that. Um, the, the work around how many bits of particles you would get coming off per flick showed that actually there were about 4,000, whereas Professor Pye, when he would really push to provide an answer, um, he put it more in the very, very low hundreds. Um, and also that material will be kept on that skirt for a great many hours, going into days, not a, not a, a manner of uh, um, just a few hours. And actually looking at the material type was really important because it happened to be a kind of a stretchy material. And so the nature of that meant it really captured stuff and it held it on there. So looking, getting access to the material was, was, was really important. There was also some really important evidence which pointed away from Keith Hyatt's van being used. And, and that was really key. Because I know there's the old adage, which, are, which I think is my next slide, or in a couple of time of, you know, absence of ev evidence is not evidence of absence. But there is a reference in this Court of Appeal judgment to there being, um, there being scientific evidence which suggested that Keith's ha Keith Hyatt's van was not used and that more attention should have been given to that negative finding. Next slide, please. And so the, um, the, the conviction was quashed. Um, as you can see here, um, and a retrial was ordered. 
fairly standard. Um, I don't think it needs any explanation in this with this audience, but a retrial was was ordered for Barry, not for Keith. He had he had already served the time that he would have served, even if he had been reconvicted of perversion in the course of justice. So Barry alone um, went for a retrial. Next slide, please. And this is the slide I was going to mention in terms of, of Edmund Locard's principle. Um, so you'll so take a look at the Barry White judgment if you can't find it on a on a um, on a database. And, you, and it will be helpful to you, then please just cut, then just email us and we'll, we'll send it over to you. We've got it. Um, and I think this is exclusionary evidence um, aspect of the appeal court judgment might just be useful in some other cases. Next slide, please. And so uh, by the time all of that happened, rough justice of the BBC, I'm so sorry to say, had been axed. It was um, thought to be old fashioned. It was very expensive. It was risky um, and, you know, makeover programs were de rigueur and could be done in in a fraction of the budget and a fraction of the time and so poor old rough justice was axed um by the time that with this case really really was you know came to an end um inside justice was launched uh three years later it, it took a long time for us to get funding um and so that's why it just took so long but it was this case and it was that that i this sort of notion which tracy's going to sort of take you on to now that um, if you get the wrong people, you leave a dangerous person at life. That sort of complete circle that was really the, the impetus for, 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 for setting the charity up. Next slide, please. And so I'm going to hand over now to Tracy. Um, over to you. Lovely. Thanks very much, Louise. So uh, as it was said in the very kind introduction, I'm currently the Director of Forensic Services for the City of London Police but I've been an advisory panel member for Inside Justice since it was first started. Louise and I had been in contact with each other about various reinvestigations um, before the, the charity itself was formed in its current state. Next one, please. So at the time of this case, I was working for what was then called LGC Forensics, which is a private laboratory, like all analytical forensic provision in the UK, we're in the unique position of not having any kind of home office laboratory facility. So all of these cases are um, examined by forensic scientists working for private uh, companies, and it makes an investigation tricky and it makes a reinvestigation even more tricky. Um, that company now is, has been bought out by, uh, by somebody else, by a French company called Eurofins, but it is one of the big three forensic providers in the UK. I was working there heading a cold case team at the time, um, and I was approached by Thames Valley Police, who have jurisdiction over the area where this crime was committed, and I very quickly phoned Louise and said, you'll never guess what has just landed on my desk. They're going to have another look at Barry White's case. Next one, please. The reason that Thames Valley were very keen to progress and thoroughly reinvestigate the case was um, because it fell under what was called Operation Cube. So some of you will remember the murder of Rachel Nickell in 1992, and uh, the things that went wrong in that case is a whole evening all in and of itself. But essentially, there was a DNA technique that was applied which didn't involve uh, an appropriate quantification stage so that you know how much material you've got. Consequently, the samples in that case were over amplified and no viable result was shown. Um, and it was suddenly realised sometime later when the the, the samples from Rachel Nickell's murder were re-examined and a profile was determined and it was somebody who'd gone on to kill very sadly un other people in the interim whilst we were correcting that error. So Operation Cube was launched to look at all cases that had involved the same technique, the low copy number DNA technique. Um, so Rachel's was the first, the Omar bombing came up as part of that investigation. And this case too fell into that Operation Cube reinvestigation um, package, particularly as of course, Barry had been to that final trial. Um, and as far as Thames Valley were concerned officially, this is now an unsolved murder. So that's why I was looking at it. It wasn't um, technically a, a cold case review or, um, or a miscarriage of just case, justice case in the traditional sense. Thames Valley Police were still very much convinced that they had got the right guy, but they needed to reinvestigate for all of those reasons. Next one, please. 
Louise showed you the slide of this crook lock earlier on, um, and the forensic strategy for the reinvestigation focused very much on this item because it was definitely determined to be the, the murder weapon and or it was absolutely used in the attack. On that yellow plastic end, there were some broken fragments of plastic that were found embedded in, in the skull of the deceased. So we knew that it had been involved in the attack and obviously we were very interested in the business end, as in where would you have held it and could we apply uh, a better, different, more sensitive technique in terms of trying to work out what touch DNA there was on the handle of that crook lock. Next one, please. There are also some hairs found which were part of the investigation. Um, the hairs didn't have roots on them, they only had hair shafts, but nevertheless um, you can use hair shafts, even if they don't have genetic material as such, to look for what's called mitochondrial DNA. So we were starting to develop a profile that we could search on the database from our murder weapon and we were also then able to say right well we've got this hair sample is going to help us exclude and also potentially back up and include more people um, as confirmatory evidence from our crook lock dna profile so we started searching that new profile on the dna database and very unfortunately got nothing at all back which was something of a disappointment next please very shortly after, though, we'd completed that work and the, the profile was being searched but coming back with nothing, there was a separate incident also in the area around Milton Keynes. A restaurant worker um, was driving, driving along, pretended to be a taxi driver, stopped, got a woman into his car, attempted to assault her. She managed to fight him off and get out of the car and then a very good citizen lorry driver happened to be in the area at the time he saw what had gone on he made sure that the woman got safely into her own home and took a note of the registration number of the car that guy was then stopped the restaurant worker um, had a paste dna sample taken that was loaded to the database and it very shortly afterwards hit against our crime scene stain profile from the crook lock next please I'm just going to give you a second to read that. This is Shardul Ahmed um, and the reading from the 2013 guilty verdict. So clearly a great result in terms of we finally found the right person. I think Louise would agree that um, Barry and Keith, although not in prison, there was still a huge shadow hanging over their their lives in that certainly members of the police force um, and I'm sure members of the community in which they lived still thought that there was a tang of guilt attached um, if they'd been prosecuted and found guilty once then clearly this is something like a technicality so this really gave them some kind of point at which they could try to move on with their lives I, I just wanted to reiterate the point that Louise was making earlier though this kind of reinvestigation would be so much harder now. Our recent cases um, have had police forces who just don't keep exhibits. They've destroyed them for reasons never adequately explained to me. Um, and actually getting hold of the exhibits, even if they do exist, has become practically impossible post the Supreme Court nun judgment, as in disclosure doesn't apply post conviction. So we cannot get exhibits for re-examination under any circumstances, and the CCRC are not always as perhaps proactive and helpful as they might be in order for us to be able to do some of this vital work. So the last thing I wanted to say to you is, if you've got a case, it doesn't have to be a miscarriage of justice case, definitely give us a call, because you might have noticed that I've got a bit of a bugbear about the entirely private provision of analytical services in the UK. There are some fantastic scientists working there, but they are constrained by the fact that the primary raison d'etre of their company is to make cash, not to investigate as thoroughly as one might like. So as a consequence, there are no fibre experts. There are hardly any blood pattern analysts who are actually employed by those companies. So if you've got something now, a defence case or at the point of appeal, we could still get those exhibits. Once it gets past that stage, it's practically impossible. So I'm now going to hand on to Damien with whom I had the 
pleasure of working when he was a senior investigating officer at Scotland Yard and I was a lowly forensic investigator then um, and he's applying now his skills and experience to some of our cases at Inside Justice. Thanks Tracy. Um, just to say really it's a fantastic privilege to be able to speak in this forum today. I spent many years um, at the Old Bailey working with some uh, tremendously uh, gifted uh, Treasury Council and QCs and uh, defence and prosecution. I hasten to add, and um, I'm very passionate about the rule of law. Uh, you wonder why an ex-cop's involved in this type of work. I'd like to think that um, if there's an error in the system, it's a failure for the whole system, and uh, I think uh, we're all duty bound to do our bit to make sure there are checks and balances in you know, what is commonly termed as the criminal justice system. I know there's uh, debate around whether it's a system or not. Um, so my role very much is the uh, focal point into the organisation for applicants. Uh, I was appointed uh, about a year and a half ago now, uh, seems like yesterday, um, and um, I, I sort of implemented a number of systems and processes to ensure that, uh, you know, there's effective um, organisation in place to manage and lead investigations and, and reinvestigations. My background is as a, a senior investigator in homicide um, and what I bring to the, hopefully to the table within Inside Justice is that uh, investigation experience alongside, it's very much a three pronged approach, investigation uh, working alongside the legal profession within Inside Justice and also working with forensic experts. Um, and in that regard, uh, quite often I'll be called upon uh, to provide sort of tactical and strategic advice, certainly in terms of homicide and, and major crime investigations uh, that support, uh, you know, whether it's a, a retrial, whether it's an application to the uh, Court of Appeal or the CCRC. Next slide, please. Uh, it's my great privilege to uh, lead the casework team. Um, so I head up the casework team as, as head of casework. Um, we've got Andrew Duffin, who has a background in commercial investigations. We've got uh, Dr. Gare Madland, who has uh, a background in uh, the academic world, and Mary Stewart, who is a former senior forensic uh, practitioner specialising in um, sex offences uh, within the Met. Um, and really, we, we, as I've said before, the focal point into the organisation for applications. We do that initial assessment process and thereafter we support uh, any specialist advice uh, and, uh, in, in terms of uh, the lawyers and the forensic experts as we move forwards, if it's a case uh, that we're going to take to the Court of Appeal or the CCRC. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, our advisory panel. We are very privileged to uh, be able to uh, work alongside um, a vast professional um, array uh, of um, uh, forensic discipline, legal discipline, uh, and as uh, former senior investigators. And uh, much of the work's done for us uh, pro bono. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of um, some of our cases, generally, uh, they're the more serious end of the business uh, for obvious reasons, really. Uh, the amount of time it takes to get a case, as you'll be uh, well aware, back before the Court of Appeal and all the CCRC uh, determines that really, and, and because of the, the amount of applications we receive, uh, generally, we, they tend to be uh, murder uh, cases, uh, serious sexual offences cases and drugs importation cases. We aspire to factual innocence um, and we, within our criteria, generally we, we look uh, that uh, the, the person convicted or incarcerated has um, five years or more left to serve. Um, but that's not always the case and, and certainly my plea to you within the legal profession would be, you know, if you've got that nagging doubt about a conviction um, and it doesn't necessarily meet the criteria, we will still speak to you and we will still work with you. Um, so that, that's not set in stone, but that, that's our sort of guiding principle as a criteria. What about guilty pleas? Uh, you, you'll be well aware of the, um, the high bar in terms of uh, any guilty pleas and, and getting the, the, those back before the Court of Appeal or the CCRC. Um, it's not impossible. We, we are working on cases currently where there have been guilty pleas. Um, 
but again, you know, talk to us uh, and, and we can work through that. Uh, recently, you know, given my homicide background, um, I spoke to Louise and decided it would be a good plan that we would review all homicide cases, so all ma manslaughter and homicide cases. Um, so we will look at all those cases. Uh, but as I've said, generally they, they tend to be uh, all, uh, at the serious end of the business, homicide, class A drugs importations uh, and, and uh, sex offence cases. Um, the problem with rape cases um, is we, we um, then they're not impossible for us to look at and investigate and to, to take forward. But as you know, they can be problematic given the fact that uh, they very much turn on the issue of consent. So if there has been a conviction uh and and it, and the case turned on consent how do you unpick that unless there's a you know a, a silver bullet that that's um come out of the blue uh and and, and has given us that that opportunity around new evidence or there's been a, a misdirection in terms of the law um it, it's very difficult to unpick but but again talk to us um and and we can we can talk that through and, and we can look at uh, cases uh, very objectively uh, next slide. So this is a bit of a snapshot uh, of our work over the last 12 to 14 months. Uh, so 406 uh, applicants during that period. Uh, following initial review, 349 cases reviewed uh, and advice provided. We've had uh, two new legal submissions to the CCRC three full referrals to the full court of appeal and uh, one conviction cost for murder uh, and 1500 hours of free uh, expert legal advice um, i actually think uh, the, the amount of hours we provide is substantially more than that um, but you can see there's a fair amount of work in, in involved uh, and a number of applicants during that period uh, next slide please so this is really just a snapshot of our process. So initially is the application stage and typically what that will look like is a prisoner will write to us from prison on prison headed uh, note paper. Sometimes there's sufficient information in there that we can look at something uh, very early doors. Um, sometimes there isn't. Uh, we use uh, open source material as well if there's uh, uh, reliable information out there in terms of um, the trial reporting process or comments by the, the judge, sentencing remarks by the judge. Uh, we conduct an, an initial review at that point uh, against our criteria test. And then uh, we either at that stage reject or we send out an application form. And the idea of the application form, it's in an easy to read and fill out format. It helps focus the person convicted to answer key questions that will help us sort of get that the ball rolling in terms of identifying what the key issues were in that case and why that individual suggests that he or she was subject to a miscarriage of justice. So hopefully that the applicant will then fill in the, the form, it comes back into us, there's a further review uh, conducted by me and uh, a caseworker at that point. Uh, at that point, quite often we will engage with an advisory panel member looking at, um, you know, is it a forensic issue, is it a legal issue? Uh, we will ask for additional documentation. Uh, typically what that will look like is a defence case statement, the agreed facts, uh, a copy of the summing up if it's available, um, and potentially any forensic reports. So we're just we're trying to build a picture uh, against what the applicant is telling us against that objective material available. And then at that, that stage, we decide whether we're going to accept it or reject the case uh, at that point. Um, and it's important to mention at this stage that um, when we do reject a case, we, you know, we provide a rationale both internally and to the applicant. Um, so they understand very much, you know, what, what the position is at that moment in time. So, you know, sometimes they can be very complex cases, but at least um, if, if at that point we haven't been able to take it f f further forward, they understand what the position is at that stage. So if in due course they reapply to us or another organisation or uh, legal entity, um, 
you know, it, it can be referred back to us and we can say, well, at that moment in time, we determined X, Y, and Z. So they're not, uh, you know, they're not um, back to uh, the starting point again. So um, if we've accepted it further, uh, it goes to open, open case stage. Um, and by then we have an established investigation strategy. We, we are understanding at that point why our key lines of inquiry are or investigation. We will have dedicated advisory panel uh, member involvement. Uh, and again, typically that will be a, a barrister uh, and one of, one of our solicitors. Uh, and if there's a forensic issue, a, a dedicated forensic expert to support us. Uh, and we will, um, and it's important to mention uh, in advance of the open case stage, we're, we're certainly not defence focused. We, we're focused in the wider interest of justice. Um, but by the time we get to open, open case stage, we start to move very much to a defence focus because by th this stage, we're pretty keen on the idea that we are going to support the applicant and we have a firm belief in what he or she is telling us. Uh, next slide, please. So this is how we approach our cases. We're, we're all passionate about justice and the, the rule of law and, and factual innocence. We certainly uh, try and provide hope where all avenues have uh, failed. Um, and if you, if you look at the criminal justice system currently, you know, is it uh, open and accessible to all? Um, probably not in my view. And, and, and that's where I think we fill a gap and we have a unique selling point. We do act in the wider interest of justice. As I've said, we are not defence focused from the outset, but once we've kicked into gear and we've identified that somebody is factually innocent and subject to a miscarriage of justice, we certainly are very much in defence mode at that point. We certainly have a no stone unturned approach. We will utilise all our forensic experts and our legal experts to uh, the nth degree. And if, we, if they can't answer our question, uh, we will look further afield. Um, we, we obviously uh, identify individual failings in cases, but uh, we hopefully want to learn uh, and improve uh, ourselves, but also improve confidence within the criminal justice system. So where we do identify failings that are linked to you know, strategic issues, and, and Tracy's mentioned it earlier on, so evidence retention uh, and the, non, uh, the R versus none judgment in relation to post-conviction uh, disclosure, uh, these are issues that we're currently taking forward with strategic partners to try and hopefully improve confidence within the criminal justice system. Uh, next slide, please. So this is um, a mission that um, Louise started uh, just over a year ago, uh, and that's to uh, better engage with the legal profession uh, and, and uh, a mission that uh, everyone in, in the legal profession knows who we are and what we do. Um, so why do we want to do that? Uh, well, it's about professional judgment. You certainly know your own cases and where they've gone wrong. We've had a recent murder case where a barrister approached us with a niggling doubt uh, right at the end of the trial, uh, voicing her concerns uh, to us. We worked very closely with her uh, senior QC uh, and that has resulted in uh, the conviction being quashed and, and there's currently a retrial. Uh, planned for later this year uh, and, and coming in early has, has ob obvious advantages as well because you know it, the, the case is uh, still warm uh, and we can we can really dig into the issues very closely um, post you know literally post conviction so that early engagement uh, gives us a good head start we can support uh, you with access to to other pro bono resources so if it is a funding issue we can try and overcome those issues. Uh, we can bring hopefully a shared expertise to the table, both us and yourselves working together, uh, and hopefully uh, demonstrating to the wider criminal justice system that we certainly do have that shared vision to improve confidence in you know, this um, elusive uh, whole system uh, termed as the criminal justice system. So how do we support our applicants? Well, you know, quite interestingly, um, when I was a, a, an SIO work, working in homicide investigations, uh, one of the really difficult parts of what I used to do was the family liaison side as, as a senior investigator working with the family liaison officer, having those difficult meetings with victims' families. 
uh, little did I think that I'd be applying some of the same skills and uh, efforts um, in a different environment. And it's very similar in my view. I mean, you're supporting people who, who are wrongly convicted uh, and their families, and, and you're, you're providing them with uh, hope uh, and you're providing them with support where perhaps they can't get uh, access anywhere else. So we very, very much engage uh, uh, with our applicants and their families. Uh, we are very accessible to them. Uh, you know, quite often we're on the phone to our applicants in prison. I hold regular meetings and updates with uh, applicants' families. So we do take the time to listen. We also, really importantly, take the time to explain, you know, where something's going right or wrong in terms of pursuing that uh, uh, investigation or you know the miscarriage of justice investigation we're conducting we, we apply that rationale uh, and we provide help guidance and support um, just to touch on the covid impact um, we, we've been very much business as usual throughout the the pandemic uh, during normal time we're all home workers in any event uh, and apart from the odd meeting in central london which have obviously uh, stopped um, but we're very much uh, as accessible in, in, during COVID as we were previously. Um, and, and we are able to contact, uh, you know, obviously some of our applicants uh, in, in prison um, by phone and, and provide that support to them where we can. Uh, and that has been difficult. And, and some of the difficulties have been getting experts in. So one recent case we had uh, was uh, getting a psychologist into a prison to see one of our applicants, and, and that's been proving very difficult. But generally, un under COVID, we've uh, operated as business, business as usual. Um, and typically, you know, we, we get 10 to 15 applications a week. Uh, next slide. Ah. So it's back over to you, Louise, is it, for this one? Sorry if I managed to find the unmute. No, no, I mean, we've done it already, really, haven't we? I just wanted to remind people of how, how they can help or be involved if they wish to, that's all. I think there's only, if you go to the next one, I think we're probably reaching the end of our pack, aren't we? Yeah, so there's yeah, our... I was just going to add, in, in terms of that accessibility point, and uh, so the, uh, yeah, the, so the... Uh, email address is there. Um, if anyone wants to come into me direct to talk about cases, uh, just just email me on the info insidejustice.co.uk, and I'll email straight back, and we can talk on the phone. Well, thank you all three. That was um, absolutely fascinating, and we've got quite a few questions in the q and I think probably the best place to start is with those that relate specifically perhaps to Barry and Keith's case and somebody wanted to know what happened to Professor Pye and I think just as a postscript to that Jerry had posted a question which I think was was more a bit of a, a four-hour information really about an expert who had been or is being prosecuted for misconduct in public office. So, so what happened to Professor Pai after his initial evidence was proved to be um, lacking? Well, he, car he carried on working, but not in, not in forensic matters relating to criminal cases. He's, he's still out there today. He's, you know, he, does, he does geological work, but not in criminal trials. He's, he changed his, his area, his focus. But I think in terms of uh, what happened to him in terms of his evidence on this case, nothing, nothing. I just wondered if um, Tracy perhaps had a, had a view about that. I mean, it does, in some senses, this case cast quite a shadow over the integrity of forensic science, doesn't it? I mean, it came to the rescue in the end, but it was to some extent part of the miscarriage in the first place. Yes, and I think it's, it just serves to reinforce the message that one of the messages we wanted to get across tonight, which is um, that challenges have to be made by defence barristers, legal representatives, because obviously I work for a police force now and I have done for most of my career. Um, when I was working for a private lab, that was also almost exclusively for the prosecution. I don't think I've ever had my evidence challenged, ever. Even a mixed DNA profile, even a low, low, low quantity of DNA, nobody has got a defence expert to say, 
well, I think there's potentially a different interpretation of that. It just doesn't happen. It's sort of fallen out of favour, as in, oh, if there's a DNA result, then barcode of guilt, what's the point in questioning that then? And it should be challenged. And it you know, sadly wasn't here. But as you say, eventually, we did get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And um, somebody else asked about what motive had been attributed to Barry in the trial by the prosecution. I think, Louise, you might have touched on that. It developed from the altercation, I think, was one of the things which you mentioned, I think. Was that essentially what the case was about from the prosecution point? Absolutely, yes. They, they, the prosecution believed that, that Barry had been had become enraged because of the fight outside. There was some evidence um, that there was the, the prosecution called some witnesses trying to sort of promote this idea that there had been tension between Rachel and Barry in the earlier part of the evening. But, but I don't think there was any real basis to any of that because there were just as many witnesses that were saying they had a great night, everything was fine. So there was some cherry picking at the time of the trial as to whether there had been any tension between Barry and Rachel earlier. And certainly most of the, the, the um, they really, uh, um, what they were really focusing on was that this flaring up of tempers afterwards had meant that that, that had sort of you know, really boiled up in Barry and he'd, he'd struck out at Rachel later on. And there was one thing that I thought was really, for me, really telling when I first started looking at it. There was CCTV, we know we saw the, the, the image of the, of the big guy with Barry and his arms outstretched and during the altercation. Well, that was, that was moving CCTV footage because the council worker you know, got the camera in the right place and recorded it and called the police in. Um, and so there was lovely footage that was pretty clear footage too, um, as well. Now the prosecution case was that, that, ba that this altercation between Barry and this other guy over this kebab salad that had been thrown, a sort of typical trivial thing, um, had meant that Barry had become really enraged. Now, when I watched that footage, what I saw was a, a young man who actually was showing a fair bit of restraint. So you saw the guy going up to Barry, you saw he was huge and he got hold of Barry and he was really in his face and there was a lot of finger jabbing and all that kind of thing. And ultimately the bloke took a bit of a punch at Barry and, and bopped him on the side of his head. And Barry's reaction to all of that was to sort of talk back, but then walk away. And so the, the, the prosecution line was absolutely strongly that, that this had enraged Barry. And so when Rachel were caught up with him later, he completely lost control because of that. And that was not, I, I thought that even just by looking at the footage, that was a huge stretch. But that was that was the basis of it. That was what, uh, that was what they said was the basis. And someone else asked, um, maybe a question for Damien, whether or not uh, you encountered police hostility. And I think someone else had also mentioned the topic of institutional bias uh, on the part of the police force. So what is the relationship with the police in relation to your investigations? That's a really interesting question. I mean, some of the research I've done in the past has been around decision making by SIOs and, and the, the whole topic of confirmation bias, which goes right the way back to Colin Stagg, of course, uh, back to Rachel Nickell. Um, I don't think hostility is the right term for it. I mean, I, th I think part part of the issue of our, the makeup of our system is 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 adversarial. I think to some extent, you know, uh, once the police and the prosecution have achieved their conviction, they, they, they sort of tend to walk away and think, well, we've now done our job. Um, you know, what was interesting in the Stag case, of course, was uh, quite rightly the case was booted out on the morning of the trial at the Old Bailey. Um, yeah, we had the police standing on the, you know, the SIO uh, standing on the on the steps of the Bailey saying, uh, you know, we're not, we're not looking for anyone else in connection with this, this investigation. Um, and they sort of had a firm belief that Colin Stagg was the man for the job. Well, of course, he wasn't in due course. Um, I think, you know, police professionalism is, is, plays into this. I think things have got a lot better. I wouldn't describe uh, it as hostility. But I think there's less recognition for reflection, perhaps, sometimes when there have been convictions. Uh, we do see, you know, when we make applications uh, post-conviction for material, you know, the, the shutters come down uh, and uh, none is quoted uh, at us. Um, so I wouldn't say it's hostility, uh, but I would say uh, I, I think, um, you, know, in, in, you know, in what I described in terms of having a system that works as one system, perhaps there's a need for better reflection uh, and how we all work together to improve the system. 
uh, but, but I wouldn't term it as hostility. Yes, and I think we've had a few questions about exhibits, and I think um, Tracy, you were you were pretty impassioned as as far as forensic scientists get, um, a bit like lawyers really, about um, the issue of retaining exhibits. And what do you think we need to see in terms of a change in our processes or even our legislation around that? I'm, I'm going to hand that on to Louise because she's done a lot of work recently with Damien um, and has done some academic. In that field, so she's definitely the best qualified. Of course. Thank you. All right. Well, I I became really infuriated by an experience on another case that we looked at in Inside Justice, where there was an ex expectation that that um, in a very there is a very interactive murder case. Um, there was a, a lot of interaction between the victim and the attacker, and the and the uh, scientists and the. Uh, police staff working at the time of the original investigation had done an absolutely terrific job of very carefully gathering all sorts of, of evidence that could be used to test objectively to find out who's, who's done it. Um, and we had a great expectation that we would be able to revisit all of that, that material and we would be able to get some new scientific tests done and let's just find out objectively. And of course, it was, we were absolutely horrified to find out that, that pretty much whole scale, the material had either been lost or contaminated or destroyed by the original investigating police force. And so we've, we've done lots of work at Inside Justice around that. We've, uh, we've, um, we've set out freedom of information requests to police forces asking what, what guidance they follow. The difficulty with the guidance that's being followed is that it has no teeth. It is a code of practice that falls from the Criminal Procedure Investigation Act, which sets out that material should be kept until the person is released from custody in the most serious category of crime. But the work that we've done, um, trying to establish how well that is known within the frontline staff that are making the decisions on what to keep and what not is, has um, shown us that there is, there is unfortunately a complete lack of awareness of what precisely should be followed. And there's some confusion over whether something else should be followed instead of this particular code of practice. So there's, there's a sort of a lack of awareness that we're, and we're trying to change that within police forces. Police forces also, of course, have terrible trouble in, the, in that they haven't got the resources they need to keep material safely in some, in some occasions. Now, I, did a, um, I interviewed the uh, Chief Constable of Surrey Constabulary as part of some research that we did. And he was really candid and, and said, you know, with the difficulty is that we have got um, storerooms that are that are under pressure, that we haven't got the staff that's required to be able to make sure they're kept properly. What should happen, I think, is some is to make sure that whatever storage facilities exist, however that is, whether that's within individual forces, whether it's on a regional basis or whatever it might be, that there is some inspection or there is some way to know whether that system is working or not. Um, because currently, the only way that we ever seem to find out if something has been kept as it should or not, is when somebody is told post-conviction that it hasn't been kept. Um, and th the only reason for keeping material post-conviction is for the sake of an appeal. So to have that imposed and then for not to be stopped recently is, is, a, is, a, is a real failure. <clears throat> so we've been, you... trying to do work to, we've been trying to do work to raise awareness and, around that. And Damien's been really, really super in sort of trying to work with police forces just to to get the level of understanding out there amongst forces. And do you think there's a role for the Crown Prosecution Service in that, Louise, rather than it simply being limited to a police archivist problem? Well, um, how do you mean if I, in terms of uh, extended to the Crown Prosecution Service? Well, as to whether or not the responsibility for ensuring that material is kept after conviction is one that is also placed in part or fully on, on the prosecutor. Well, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I haven't thought, I haven't thought before whether that's where the responsibility needs to be. Currently, it is with the police force. They are sort of the officially the owners of it, of the whatever the material is, and and I and that's that's really is problematic. I I don't know, I I don't know whether or not it's who's got the decision that means the decision isn't happening properly. It's just that there isn't. When a case is finished and it's gone to trial and the conviction's in, there is a sort of a general sense, I would imagine, of that, you know, a job well done, that's great. And the next bit isn't 
it isn't um, inspected by anybody. There is no sense of knowing whether it's happening. It's rather like the pre-conviction disclosure failings. You know, it's only when you suddenly get to a point of absolute crisis that you then have a, have a position where, where a disclosure improvement plan is announced and then there are, there's lots of inspection that goes with that. And that hopefully will improve the system um, for all. So it's, you know, cu currently the system is random, ad hoc, and and quite often completely inadequate. And every time that happens, it means that whoever's sitting in prison saying, "I haven't done it," can we test the material? That can't happen. And so it's a, you know, it just it just is completely unsatisfactory for all parties because that leaves a sense that. The force has covered something up or has deliberately got something they've got rid of something it, the whole thing it, all of that is unsatisfactory so the way we have it is not is not adequate yeah and of course that's against a background isn't it of continuing advances in forensic science so that we've certainly found with a great many investigations into uh, older cases that we can now answer questions which simply couldn't even have been asked when they were originally investigated. So uh, another reason, I suppose, for making sure that we've got an intact body of investigative material when we come to review cases. Yes, I mean, the other thing I would add to that is that, yeah. is that I think that when, the case, when cases come into Inside Justice that have some forensic angle to them or, or could have, we, the scientists on our panel work really, really hard and they can work up a strategy in a fairly short space of time. The amount of time it then takes for the system to decide whether that work can go ahead, who's going to do it, is it going to happen at all, can we find the stuff, are we going to give permission for it, can we get the test done, it's just that just goes on for years, you know we've had we've had cases where the same the strategy that we drew up four years ago is still being debated, you know, that, that those sorts of the the issues around the the way the system works are, are they, they, they just they just um, they, they make everybody freeze they stop all activity going forward, when actually, if we just got on and did the work, we would have the answer objectively, scientifically, and that would give, give resolution to all parties involved. We've got a few questions, um, Louise, maybe for, for either Tracy and Damon as well, about whether or not the work that you're doing should be done pro bono, or whether it should be done on a different basis, whether in fact we need to be lobbying for a different way of investigating and reviewing cases where there is a doubt. I mean, there obviously are, are avenues, but is, is that something which is a part of your own pitch to government, that there ought to be funding, for example, that things shouldn't have to be done by a charity or even television programmes when that was the position? Shall I take that or does anybody else want to come in? I was just going to kick off by saying I, I can't... I can't see a route through to that. Um, we're really fortunate with the advisory panel members and the trustees that support us in order to be able to do the work that, that we clearly think is vital to the, to the criminal justice process. But from a policing point of view, I had my budget cut this year. I will have my budget cut next year. I've had my budget cut every single year for as long as I can now remember. Um, last year it was 25 percent so I was trying to point out, if I arrest four people in a car, which one of them do you not want me to process? Because all of these things cost money. So I just cannot see any route to getting funding to set up something. The argument will be from the Home Office, oh, there's, the, there's the CCRC, don't you worry about that. Or their record number of how many cases they've referred over their X number of years history is woefully tiny. Um, but that will be the answer. We, you've got them. If we've already put money into it, they, that's resourced and that's our answer. I just, I would love it, but I can't see any way that it's going to happen. No. And, uh, and a question here about whether you work in cases involving young offenders. Is that a part of your workload? Uh, absolutely. Damien, do you want to, to come in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've um, certainly, you know, as, as you'll be aware, there's been a prevalence in the last decade or two in terms of youth crime and homicide and gang related homicides. And, and we get a regular share of those types of cases. So uh, we, we absolutely work in that arena and we, we, we encourage, you know, that type of work. Um, if, you know, if people, uh, uh, delegates have got any cases uh, that they're thinking of to refer in. 
And, and another question on a completely different but uh, fascinating topic, whether there's any prospect that you would or we would use recent developments in neuroscience in relation to mens rea in criminal cases. I don't quite know what might be envisaged there, whether that's brain scans to ascertain whether people are telling the truth or whether it's possible that they couldn't have formulated a specific intent or something like that. But maybe that's a sort of blue sky question for Tracy. Certainly got um, forensic psychiatrists that we can call on that have reviewed behavioural aspects of some of our applicants, um, their behaviour at the time, their behaviour since, that they've reviewed statements that they provided um, and they've given us a, a view on what the professional psychiatric position is. But I don't know if you can scan a brain and say, oh, they definitely had a bit of a guilty mind about that one. Um, it would be great if we could stop faffing around with all the fibre bits and pieces if we could just do it. But I'm afraid it's not my area of expertise, and I don't know if that's available. But we do have great forensic psychiatrists who have certainly been very helpful in determining how we should progress cases in the past. And there are some questions on a different topic about whether you work cross borders, and it, another question about whether you would work in relation to Scottish cases. And, and if you don't, whether you might make an exception where Scottish cases could find themselves going to the Supreme Court in relation to Article 6 mas miscarriages, for example, and access to a justice and fair trial um, issues. So generally, do you have a sort of cross-border interest going perhaps into Europe and so on? or And would you in particular accept Scottish cases? We never have. Shall I give the background, Damien, and then you can give the future? Um, we, we never have. We've always concentrated on England and Wales. You know, we're working within the, the legal system that we are operating in here and just simply because it's a different legal system. And so we don't we don't stray into it. But I'll leave it to you, Damien, for any any other points on top of that. No, I, I, other than the point of um, obviously what what we aspire to is factual innocence in, in any event. So although it might be going to the Supreme Court, um, a touch point would have to be looking at factual innocence uh, in any event. Um, but, uh, you know, again, call us and, and we can talk about it. Um, you know, we never say never. So you might do, is the answer. It just uh, depends Maybe. upon people referring cases to you. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. We've, yeah. we've also, sorry. So, may I just pick up on something there? The, the, Damien mentioned earlier, but I, but but Siobhan Gray QC, the silk involved in the murder case that we that Damien referenced earlier, that was quashed, um, was was at pains to say to me, you know, I really must make sure that the, that I tell people this evening that the thing that did make that case so viable was the fact that Siobhan came to us, as Damien said, just after the the guilty verdicts came in, because that may, and that ties in with everything that we're talking about, you know, whether you're going to find material, whether it, whether it's you know, still going to be there, whether you're, you can get access to it, uh, whether me people's memories are fresh, whether there's, you know, all it, it makes a huge difference. Occasionally, we have people who come to us and say, well, can I come to you if, if um, we fail at the CCRC? And, and our hearts sink, frankly. I mean, yes, of course people can. If people can apply to us however many times they've been, they've been rejected by others, we will take a look. But the, the hill is so much steeper and so much harder if you if so many of these these other sort of you know moments have been lost and um, so in the Barry White case the guilty verdicts were just in that's when we started looking at it the murder case had just been convicted uh, quashed exactly the same and there's also a difference I just wanted to sort of set out for the, you know thinking particularly of our the the legal the the, uh, the lawyers who are here today um, it's the question of will we work on it without you do you have to be assigned to do they still have to be assigned to the case is it all right if I just, get, just sort of give some information about that. We, we, we generally will um, take a case on for ourselves and, and deal with it completely if there is no legal team. That's sort of generally that most of the cases, people have come into us, they, their legal teams have done all they can, but that, 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 that's the end of it, and they are without representation. So that's so, and we can then provide representation. But equally, the case where the murder conviction was quashed. It, with that, with the trial, Silk, Siobhan Gray and Jason Larty, the solicitor, 
they carried on with the case pro bono through to the trying to get the, the appeal successfully um, because they were so committed to it. Now that worked also for Inside Justice. That worked like a dream because it meant that that um, that Siobhan and Jason were very much leading on the strategy of the case. They were the kind of like the real workhorses behind it in terms of where we're going. But Inside Justice was there for case conferences. We provided forensic experts. We did people tracing. We you know we can go and talk to witnesses. We can take statements. So we so it, it worked very well also in that situation because we were working sort of as a team. What doesn't work so well is if there is a legal team and somebody comes to us and then we are sort of part of the strategy, but then somehow get ignored. That, that, that's obviously a difficult relationship because it means that we've persuaded experts on our advisory panel to do all sorts of work. And then actually, you know, it, all of that might just sort of be dumped to one side. So if it's like the, the sort of Siobhan case where the, the murder case where they are leading, we are providing a service, and then but they are strategizing, that's super. If we are dealing with all of it, that's also super. That also works really well. So so the whether somebody is involved still or whether they want to be involved in the future is entirely up for discussion. There, there, there are no absolute hard and hard and fast rules about that. But obviously we just need to be sort of clear about what the roles are and to what extent we're we're engaged. And I think on the question of um, teams and and who's doing what, uh, one of our attendees of our attend is is very interested in knowing because I think they posted the question twice whether students who might be interested in a legal career can volunteer or do work experience at um, Inside Justice. I mean, do you? And let's just not confine that to students. Is there a role for people who might want to do some pro bono work with you or as part of your team, or is it something that really requires expertise and you don't have a lot of donkey work to do? It's it's really Damien. Do you want to to to, to speak to, on this, or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can uh, briefly touch on it. I mean, we do, uh, we, we haven't mentioned that we do collaborate with uh, three universities currently, um, uh, law students and uh, investigative journalist students. So we, we, we do utilise that resource. We do um, on occasions, and it's very much about the, the right place at the right time. Um, so our evidence retention um, project we're working on currently to try and influence um, the MPCC and government. Uh, we've been working with the University of Northumbria, uh, Professor Carol McCartney on that case. And uh, one, of our, uh, one of our students um, who's not part of the university collaborations uh, helped us uh, do, do some uh, useful research on, on that project. So it, it, we, we, we do uh, utilize that support. Um, it, it, it's dependent on the right place at the right time and, and particular projects that are ongoing. In terms of casework, it, it can become quite difficult because it's about uh, harnessing that, um, uh, that resource and, and overseeing that resource. And, and uh, part of the problem is we all remotely work. So it, it, can, be, it can be difficult, but um, we, we will work with people with the right skills um, if, we're, if we're able to. Uh, Louise? Thanks, Damien. Yeah, in terms of the um, sort of expert uh, um, um, offers of, of help, we try and keep the advisory panel to the, sort of, to the limited numbers we have on it currently. So it's around about a dozen people. And we try and keep it to that number because we meet four times a year. Um, when we could meet in person, then we would often meet for an afternoon. So it was quite a bit of time commitment. And of course, there's work to be done in between those meetings in terms of, of actual casework being done. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But we do receive offers of help from other experts, from, from experts outside of the sort of permanent members of the panel. Um, and we're very grateful for those offers of help. They, they are kind of the lifeblood, really, of the organisation. And what we tend to do with those is that we, we then um, sort of uh, see where the, what the level of expertise is and where it might fit. And we then keep a database where if there's a case that comes in that's got a, you know, needs a particular expert, a fraud expert or whatever it might be, then we think, okay, well, we don't have that person permanently on our panel because we don't get many of those cases typically, but here's, an, here's a case where we could need that and we've got somebody who's, who's indicated before that they would be prepared to help. And then if in that situation, we would go to the expert and we would then say, this is what the case is, this is what the task is, do you have the time capacity and the interest to do so? 
I suppose the other thing that we should say is that I think the reason why the charity works is because we get, you know, in the scale of things, in the scale of charitable organisations, we have a fairly small budget on an annual basis, which allows the legwork, the sort of the, a lot of the donkey work, to be done before it goes to the experts. So, so we, um, we will take the lion's share within the casework team in terms of, you know, by getting the papers, marshalling the information, working out what the issues are, deciding what the key papers are that an expert is likely to be able to want to, to read and see before they make a view, so that we do everything we possibly can to sort of to make the, the free expert bit on top from the advisory panel members as, as small as possible, as manageable as possible. You know, quite often it might be that a barrister says to us, well, thanks for those bits, but actually I'd like X, Y and Z as well. And we, we go off and we get those and, you know, more work comes. But, but, but we try and I think the reason it works is because we are not saying to experts, whether that's a scientist or a, or a lawyer or anybody else, we're not saying, thanks for the offer of help. Here's the case. Tell us when you've, you know, when you've cracked it. We are very much trying to direct activities that are really going to make the, the most of that person's expertise. And what is the expertise? We've got one question about uh, statistics and experts in that area. But uh, as you say, you, you need to get experts who are relevant to the particular features of a case. But what's the sort of main areas of expertise that you go to time and time again? I mean, does it include statistics, for example, or is that a little bit on the, the wings? Tracy, will you? Yeah. Oh, we're fortunate enough to have um, Professor Denise Indicum Court on our panel who is a forensic geneticist and an excellent statistician. So we've pretty much got her hooked in every time she looks at it. Um, we bribe her with biscuits and please with her never to leave us ever. Because the statistical analysis of the DNA challenge is a really tricky bit. And your um, question set is absolutely right. It's, you have to get it right. Um, but also I would encourage anybody that's faced with evidence and the prosecution case that has any kind of statistic in it, then get your own expert and see if they say something different, because quite often they will. In yeah, terms well, that... of the other, the other expertise we have, our, the, our sort of go-to standard expertise, I suppose, sort of falls in the area of um, we have DNA issues. DNA, you know, we can is it, could we get something now? Have they done it, whatever they've done at the time? Is that right? So DNA experts. We also have blood pattern analysis expert who we call Joe Middleton. We call on greatly. Joe gets really involved with a lot of our cases. Um, we have CCTV experts, cell site experts, pathologists. Um, we also have legal experts, of course. There are also quite a few people involved with the, with the charity at various levels who are um, expert in investigations. So, you know, with Damien being our most obvious example, but. But beyond Damien, there are other people within the team that are who are just you know are, who are experts who are very good at, at seeing where the strategy should have been, where the holes might be, where there could be something that we would look at now. But so basically, the thing to think about inside justice is if there is an expert that you expertise that you can't see on our panel, then don't let that push you off because we will find them, <laughs> we will chat them down, and we will convince them that if the case has merit that. That we need to get some help on it and if we get to a stage with a case where we i mean by and large the vast majority of the stuff that we do is pro bono but if we get to a stage where we can't do something there was a for instance there was a 999 tape that we needed to be analyzed some years ago um we wanted to know what the sound was on the back of the in the background of the of the 999 recording we couldn't get that done pro bono. The only people that were doing it were commercial labs that we could find. And so we ended up going to a commercial lab. They gave us a better rate, but then we found the budget within Inside Justice to be able to pay for that. So, so you know, we will find an expert, whatever the expert is. If the, if the case deserves it, we'll find it. And we'll either get it done pro bono or we'll find a way to get it done. It's, everything is driven by what value does it actually bring to the case? We won't run around and get all kinds of work done unless it will really make a discernible difference to the outcome of the case. You know, if it's tinkering around the edges, we're not going to persuade somebody to give their Sundays up to, to, to work on something for free. But if it really could make a, um, a sea change difference to that case, then we will do our level best to get it done. We also have a fabulous fibres expert, and they're like hen's teeth these days, which are the only <laughs> standing. 
and they shouldn't be they shouldn't be and we should we should be doing more of that work it's another conversation about the demise of the forensic science service and the expertise that went with it but yes it's a it's it shouldn't be the case well it's very impressive i think that you've got those connections with so many experts and you've been able to assemble them in one place and i think it's it's something which will be of interest to many of our attendees you've talked about the work that's done pro bono by experts i mean i see we're we're heading towards the end of our time i mean what is your funding position apart from that i mean where do you where do you get most of your funds from louise it is entirely from trusts and foundations and the goodness of people's hearts. It really is. It is a, and I have to say, it is a, you know, I'm not very good at talking about money, but it is a, a horrible long slog because in the charity world, you, you know, you've got the, the, the pet kind of, you know, causes, haven't you? You've got cancer charities, which are, you know, hugely deserving, and you've got soldiers and you've got donkeys and dogs, and, and then way down at about 500 on the list, you, you've got the wrongly convicted. And, and that's, it's one of those causes that if somebody be, um, if somebody becomes involved in a case or they have an experience of a case, then I think they remain with the cause for the rest of their lives, even if their loved one or whoever it might be is, is no longer caught up in it. They understand the importance of it, and so they they stay with it. But but they but most people don't, thankfully. Most people aren't aware of the difficulties um, and just how lonely and frightening it must be if your loved one is suddenly going to prison tonight and has no prospect of help and no prospect of, of freedom. Um, so our funding comes just from trusts and foundations. Now, one thing that people really can help us with is if, if you're aware of a trust or foundation, then please, and you think they might be supportive of our work, then please tell us about that trust and foundation because it's, it's hard to know who they are. And we're a tiny team with, you know, we, we don't have dedicated fundraisers. So there's somebody saying to us, here's a trust that could be, could like your kind of stuff. Or I know a trustee that might really be interested in hearing about your kind of work. It's absolute gold for, from our point of view. And then also there are people who just decide to give 10 quid a month. And that sort of level of commitment means that the long-term viability of the charity is suddenly on so much more of a solid basis. So However little it is, it, it will make a difference and it will go directly to helping people that really need help. Well, Louise, thank you. I think it's evident from our questions that we could continue um, asking questions of the three of you for some time, but we've, we've reached the end of our time this evening. So I hope we've covered most of the topics which have been raised by those who've asked questions. And thank you for everyone who has put a question in the Q&A. We've also in the chat put your website address. So if anyone is interested, and I'm sure many of those who are here this evening will be, do look in the chat function, you'll see the website, or you can look up Inside Justice, of course, on a search engine and go to the website and do go and watch the film, which you will see when you get there, which is, I think, on the home page which will tell you quite a lot more, I think, narrated by Tom Conti, who is one of your, um, I think, spokespeople and supporters. A, trust, a trustee and advisory trustee. panel member and, and much loved for it. He's a good man. Good. Well, we'll thank all three of you for a fascinating evening and starting with a miscarriage of justice, which I think was um, e extremely um, elegantly explained. Thank you, Louise, in a very interesting way, and which was a natural introduction to everything which came after and which was truly fascinating. So thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. Uh, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us.